let's let's get started and, and let's start with framing what it is you want to talk about today. So tell me in a bit more detail about what we're going to be discussing today and, and I guess ideally where you would like it to end up if you've got an idea of that. Sure. Um, basically, through your writings and your videos, I came across this concept of the nice guy syndrome. Sure. And uh, it just uh, you know, spoke volumes to me and I instantly identified with pretty much almost all the aspects of it. And kind of growing up, I guess I've got one friend in particular who kind of was the same as me. We just kind of always knew we were really nice guys. We always knew and struggled and joked about how we can't really get anywhere with the ladies. And it was like a running dialogue about how all these jerks were getting all the dates and how frustrating that was. <laughs> and um, that's kind of been the, the background narrative over my life. And then seeing it kind of in black and white from your side of things brought it full focus. And I was like, whoa, this is actually a, a thing and mm. is actually a, a not a good thing. And it sounds like, and it's, it's been pretty painful for me, you know, over that period, well, over my life. Um, and then seeing that, yeah, that this is a thing and then you could actually do something about it was really intriguing. Well, what was it like for you, just that first realization that this is a thing? Uh, actually, it was, it was like a realization that this is actually more serious than what I had ever really understood it to be um, in terms of how, how it's been hampering my life and kind of affecting all areas. You know, before it just was kind of an inside joke between me and my friend that, yeah, we're struggling with this and we're noticing that and but it was painful, like deep down, you know? Um, yeah. So it was like a, like a stark realization that, Hey, this is, this is pr like more serious than what you were really realizing. So similar to my experience with it. I mean, I had the friend as well, me and the friend and our inside joke about how we sucked with girls and kind of self deprecating humor around that. Uh, and, and support of each other, you know, at least you're not dying alone. Um, but also, yeah, it wasn't, I already knew it was serious by the time I found out. What I didn't realize was how, how much it affected every single area of my life. So I, again, like you, I knew like this is causing me some issues with girls. I can see that me being too nice is somehow a barrier that didn't make sense to me at the time. Um, but no, for me, the big wake up call was like, holy shit, every single thing that I do in any form socially is affected by this. This goes far beyond the attractive girls. It goes to everything. So yeah, that was a pretty brutal wake up call for me. Um, what I've learned since then, obviously, is a fair bit, but is that it's not the same for every guy. Every nice guy has a slightly different version. They have a lot of like overlap things that they have in common um but i think it's important before we even get into the specifics of where you want to go with this that you give me a sense of what type of nice guy you are what it means to you what role it plays in your life how it affects your behavior um from your perspective so i get an idea of what the the you know the the chris version of of nice guy syndrome is Sure, like <clears throat> the short version that comes to mind is just I pretty much put everybody else first and put my and then I just end up being last. And those people really don't appreciate it or give me what I need uh, for my own self in return. And then I'm just like defeated and deflated and, and frustrated and angry.
So I think we can call that self-sacrificing one of the very, very common uh, factors for nose guy syndrome. We can also see kind of the already get a sense of the, uh, what I'd call the subconscious selfish driver. So it sounds to me like in your head, you're telling yourself you're this very helpful, caring person who takes care of others. And then if you get angry and bitter about not being appreciated, we can see that you're not getting paid the way you want to get paid for this. Um, and that was, for me, that was one of the biggest wake up calls, which was I'm not altruistic. I'm not the kind caring person I thought I was. I'm doing a deal with people and I'm getting pissed off that they're not paying their end of the bargain. This is not freely given at all. In fact, it's kind of a debt that I put people in. So I've done this nice thing for you and now you owe me. Now I wouldn't quite say that to myself in my head in those terms. I'd kind of work around that, mm -hmm. but I'd come to a justification with they've been mean to me. They've not done their part. This is unfair and so on. Does that kind of resonate with you? Yeah, it, it does. I usually, yeah, I go, there's two, two things I guess came to mind just now. I go out of my way to help other people and then, you know, they don't necessarily appreciate it because they didn't ask for it. And then also like the women I've dated, the people I've worked with, like none of them go as far out of their way to help me. So it's just a natural imbalance. Um, uh, which leaves me, yeah, kind of resenting things a bit. And then the, the second part is just, <clears throat> just coming up short myself. So like a, like a quick example is this girl that I was interested in, right? And she and I had a really good rapport, man. Like every time we're together, it's just really solid and uh, joking and laughing and really a lot of similarities and good vibes. And she was in a really rocky relationship with the guy she was dating and he was kind of uh like mistreating her and she was unhappy about it and it's like i could have you know i felt like i could have made a move or at the very least expressed my interest in her <laughs> but uh what do you what do you think i did instead i i saw she was hurting and i actually gave her advice how to patch things up with her current boyfriend and I was just like, I can't believe I just did this. <laughs> yeah. Not the first oh, one yeah. to do that. What's that? You're not the first one to do that. That's for oh, sure. that was probably like the lowest point because that was even after I had started um, seeing your videos on this topic. And it's like, I still couldn't help myself. Even in the moment, I was like, don't say it, don't say it. Oh, you said it. <laughs> and so, so those are the two, the two ways that it really gets me down is one, people not being able to reciprocate because no one else sacrifices themselves as much as I do. And then the second one is just my own kind of coming, coming in last because I've put everyone first. Yeah. So one part of this is you've kind of set up a system where you can only lose. And you've also, there sounds like there's a compulsivity to this. So you can actually watch yourself doing this and feel helpless to stop it happening. In, in that case I did. Yeah. <laughs> I want to start by really emphasizing how really just normal and common this is. And that's not an excuse to continue with it, but just there's a great sense of loneliness and nice guy syndrome. Like, am I the only one who does this? Am I the one sacrificing the most and so on? Um, when the reality is there's millions of us all with our own separate flavor and our different preferences for certain behaviors. But we've all got this one thing in common, and that is we have a coping strategy for emotional pain. And usually it's around trying to make others feel happy, which makes us feel good about ourselves. And we've got like this coping mechanism is essentially a strategy 
to make that happen. So it sounds to me like your self-sacrifice is your strategy. You help people, you fix things for them, you do everything for them. It's based on the idea that they're supposed to then reciprocate or appreciate in some way, which gives you the, the drug you need, that good feeling. And as most nice guys, when you get older, it starts to wear off. It doesn't happen as much as you thought it was supposed to. And then it doesn't really happen much at all. And even when it does, it's not good enough because you can't get high on it anymore. You need such a bigger hit. And we end up in this place like, holy shit, what the fuck have I been doing? Um, very normal. And even the process of trying to finally realize what's going on, that it's a thing and that it's worse than you thought it was. It isn't just this nice, happy little thing called people pleasing. It's actually quite a dark and twisted psychological loop of, of pain and, and nobody wins. And facing all that's like, it's incredibly painful. But once faced, it can be dealt with. I want to already plant a seed in your mind to think of this as a drug addiction because dealing with it this way, when I make stuff online, I call it like recovery because that's essentially what it is. It, it follows the exact same pattern of, as drug use and it's done for the same reasons as drug use. It's all about emotions. Nice guy syndrome is an addiction to approval and validation from others. Hmm. that are used these are these are kind of we inject ourselves with these and we get high for a little while and then the high wears off and we try to get some more but we can never get back to that first high and it gets less and less and then we need like ton of appreciation just to function let alone get high or feel good without realizing we never should have taken the drug in the first place it's causing its own craving it's actually the cause of the pain now it's funny the original reason someone becomes a nice guy is usually something traumatic in their childhood or something misunderstood that is received traumatically like being left out of the group or having a strict or enmeshing parent but then in the end we're the nice guy because we were the nice guy it's now become the cause of itself you know the way you describe that situation is a perfect example you basically push this girl away with your nice guyness, which creates the loneliness that will aggravate more nice guyness. So now the thing's creating itself. You're in a loop. Facing it's hard, man. Um, catch me up to the present moment. So I get a sense, I didn't really get a, like a sense of when these things are happening or how much they affect you, but where are you at with this at this time? Um, uh, you mean the, the entire nice guy aspect? Like how is it affecting you in your current life? Current life. I've, well, the biggest one is around, you know, um, around, women and dating, which I'm just not, I don't. So I was interested in that girl, but I haven't, that was months ago and I haven't seen her since and there's no one else that I'm interested in right now. So that part's not really playing out. Um, I think where it plays out is I have a lot of anxiety around my work and like when people show like a little bit of disappreciation at work, like if I'm not doing something right or not doing it quite fast enough, or sometimes I find myself in a role that I'm not really suited for. So I'm not performing up to their level of expectations or even my own standards. It's just, uh, it's not a good fit for that role. And then, then I get anxiety and even like, asking for a day off of work you know you've earned the vacation days even just asking for that day off i'm like really tense and full of anxiety like i don't know if that's because of the nice guy syndrome like i don't want to disappoint anybody by not being there or anything like that 
but I think it, I think it's, yeah, it contributed to like a general, general anxiety just around a lot of my interactions with people. Again, very, very common. And uh, what I'm hearing is a little transition that you've gone through maybe quite recently that I see quite a lot. And first, nice guys can be quite like seeking approval and they're kind of active and trying to get it like the strategy of self-sacrifice, like doing it in this way that like gets appreciation. Um, and is what the kind of like the, the minor to that major is avoidance of disapproval. And what it sounds like sometimes the minor and the major can switch, which now is you're not interacting with women at all and you're highly anxious and avoidant at work. So now rather than going towards approval, you're trying to run away from disapproval and avoid it. And that's essentially like strategy one didn't work. So now we go to the full, fallback plan, which is, um, you know, run and hide. Um, and yeah, that's again, very normal and chronic anxiety and nice guy syndrome go together hand in hand. They overlap so much. They might as well be the same thing. Uh, it was amazing for me when I stopped being anxious and realized, holy shit, I've always felt that way. I didn't notice I had something because it was so um, consistent that when it went away, I was like, why do I feel so light on my feet? And you know, why do I feel so good? I don't know, it's because I was always anxious. I didn't know that that was a state that, you know, this kind of low buzzing sickness in my stomach all the time, constant fretting and planning and strategizing. Um, so basically your anxiety probably comes from a number of sources. One is just that constant high alert for disapproval and constant attempt to prevent and avoid it. So it's basically like, knowing you're about to go to war, but not knowing where the war is going to come from. So trying to plan for every potential thing all the time uh, creates a massive buzz of anxiety. What I also noticed, and you have to tell me whether or not this applies to you, uh, but I got a sense from your emails that it might, which is my anxiety went away when I started behaving with integrity and doing what I was supposed to do with my life, which I then rationalized backwards to realize part of my anxiety was that sense of distance between who I was being and who I was supposed to be. This kind of loss of self that had me very worried, like what the fuck am I doing with my life? Am I wasting it? I think I might be a very scary thought, especially being an atheist. I'm like, I've got one shot and I think I'm fucking it up. Uh, and I think I've been fucking it up for a long time. And I don't know how to not do that because I don't even know how I'm fucking it up. So I had that kind of anxiety as well as just the day-to-day, -day, like where's the threat coming from? How much does that resonate with you, if at all? Yeah, 100%. So um, in terms of the, <clears throat> yeah, other jobs I've done in the past, I, yeah, it, uh, um that's the easiest way to say it is like, I would, I would just become pretty miserable and unhappy, just super unhappy. Um, uh, let's be honest. Like you could say like pretty depressed in some circumstances. And I, I did kind of just instinctively boil it down to like, this is not what I'm here for, man. This is like a waste of my time. Like, it's not what I'm meant to be doing. Um, that, so anyway, I, rec I recognize or relate to that part of what you said. I'm in the wrong, in the wrong spot. It's not what I'm meant to be doing. And it's almost like there's a part of me that recognizes that. And then that part is the one that's getting all kind of bummed out. Cause like, dude, you're wasting your time. And then I'm like, I don't know what else to do. I'm going to keep going to work. And it just grows and grows. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's again, very normal. And I, I never like to give false hope 
but what you're talking about is mm -hmm. essentially totally I don't know, fixable is the right word, but this can all be corrected through changes in behavior. Mm. It's, it's like being lost and you can't find the path again, even if you spent many years off that track. Um, I, you know, what I call values or integrity, I think of it as a kind of a GPS we have in our heads. It starts beeping when we go off the path. After a while, we get used to that beeping noise and we don't know what it means anymore. We just, you know, that guilt after not confronting someone or that frustration with our work or that slapping your head every time you talk a girl out of liking you. You know, that GPS has been beeping for quite some time. The upside meaning is you might be lost, but you've always known where the path is because you know when you're not on it. And then that's the first, like, I guess, optimistic thing I want to plant with you here is one of the reasons you're so anxious and pissed off at yourself is because some part of you knows what you're supposed to be doing. It has a comparative measure. It must do. If it watches you talk to a girl and goes, oh, I can't believe you said that, then it knows what you were supposed to say. Or at least it has the gist. It knows that, wasn't it? You know? Um, and so that's a good place to be because I remember a time in my nice guy now where I, the, the GPS was silent. I didn't even realize something was wrong. So I was getting so much validation and approval from people, especially in my late teens, early twenties was when I was kind of riding the high and didn't realize I was slowly getting separated from myself and I was going to crash and burn later on, but I was getting lots of laughs and lots of what looked like the love and so on. Um, but you're hearing the, the beat pretty loudly now. And I want to just, I want you to just realize that that's in you. I don't know what that is, but you do. Part of you does. So you're not like rudderless here. You've actually got a, an inbuilt guidance system and it's asking you to do things. It's telling you not to do things. And it's what I call simple, but not easy. You, the changes you're looking for are as simple as obeying that guidance system. But that is not an easy thing to do. To obey that guidance system will require facing huge amounts of confusion and fear. It'll require pissing people off and getting their disapproval, being so-called rejected by them. It'll require feelings like embarrassment and loss and anger and require all of those things that you've been avoiding just like getting off a drug requires you to feel your feelings again that's essentially the same thing that's going to happen here that guidance system is going to take you on track but it hurts to get back on track mm. how do you feel about the, that prospect where you're going to have to kind of pay to get back on track like it's going to hurt emotionally to do so Uh, um, without censoring my thoughts, I kind of, my, my initial just gut feeling is it, it couldn't be any more painful than what I've been going through. So it's, it's, it is scary, a little bit daunting maybe, but that's my initial thought is like, it couldn't be any worse than what I've been through. And the fact or the thought that I could go through something that's only as bad as what I've been going through, but would actually be leading to a better outcome is actually pretty appealing. Someone has to be there for this to actually work. There are nice guys that I, that I'll work with and I kind of turn them away and say, come back later because it doesn't hurt enough yet for them to pay the price of pain to get back on track. You know, I think it's an old Tony Robbins fucking guru classic where the pain of change has to be less than the pain of staying the same. And it sounds like you're in that position. And that was a key one for me. Like one of my key triggers for getting started was almost four years of celibacy, which was no 
not my choice in any way. I was just that repellent to women for such an extended period of time. I was trying every week, you know, that's 200 plus weeks. It did not work. Um, and that hurt enough where I'm like, there's nothing worse than this. There's nothing worse than being completely unlovable. I'll do anything. I'll fucking humiliate myself if I have to, because it won't be as bad, but it's a different kind of pain. The kind of pain to get back on track is short and sharp. It'll peak higher on the graph than what you're going through, but for only a brief period of time, rather than the dull, slow, continuous agony, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, being a nice guy is like walking with stones in your shoes and then breaking out of it is like getting punched in the face. It's a lot more, but then it's over and you're kind of in this new place and it's better and it heals pretty quickly, you know. Mm. I don't know if that's the best analogy, but it, I don't like to bullshit people. There's no like smooth way out of this. It was trying to be smooth that got you into this problem in the first place. Mm. The, the, the solution to nice guy syndrome is actually to embrace and run into suffering, to see it for the illusion it is, rather than constantly backing away right at the edge, you know, backing away from a rejection, backing away from disapproval, backing away from embarrassing yourself. It was like, if you could just push through that little cloud of emotion on the other side is where you want to be. It's right fucking there. It's really frustrating once you get through it and you go, is that all I had to do? Holy shit, that's nowhere near as bad as I, you know, 10 years, 20 years I've been avoiding that feeling. It's nothing. Mm. But your brain's not going to say that when you try to do it. Your brain's going to go, no, fuck that. It's not worth it. It's too scary. Your heart's going to pound and your face will go red and hot and it will be like, this is surely something I shouldn't do. You know? Yeah, but they're just feelings. They're kind of, I call them misfires. They're going off like you're in major danger when you're really not. They don't go off in the real danger, which is the nice guy syndrome. And that's when you're really putting yourself at risk. Um, if you're avoiding disapproval and you're kind of in some sort of unconscious way, staying away from women, whatever excuses you give yourself, uh, now's not the right time and so on. It tells me that that's where the pain has to occur. That's where the, the walls are that need to be broken through. I want, before we get into this next part where I'm leading, I guess, uh, I want you to let go of the idea that you're going to be obliged to do anything. Cause that's going to like stir up your fear and make kind of problem solving and, creativity just go down the toilet so i want you to know that even if we come up with ideas around what you could do you don't have to do them you could just have those ideas and, and never do them if you want you need to be free to think of these ideas without pressure to follow through hmm. with that in mind when you think about what behaviors might need to change what kind of pain you might need to embrace what comes to mind? Oh, it's just like <clears throat> physiological pain, like real physical pain, like in my stomach. It's a knot. It feels like an ulcer. Um, I think that's the that's the biggest one for me. And so, like, for example, if I see a girl that I want to go talk to. I'll get that feeling and then it feels like if I just turn away and go the other direction and leave it alone, that that anxiety pain will go away. And so that's usually what I do. And then also I haven't been super strong in the attracting women area all my, my whole life. So I, I don't know. I've often got just bad responses from them. So that's actually painful too, to sit there and, you know, deal with that in the moment, her, their, their replies, the rejections, some of them have been just downright mean, 
<laughs> and I'm just like, okay, well, yeah. Anyways, um, so there's that, and then, um, yeah, I guess those two, those two things. So I want you to notice this is what we'll call the price. Stomach and knots, unpleasant reactions from women. That's what you've been refusing to pay. Yeah, that's the cost of being on track. That's the cost of like being able to see the screen of the GPS and know where you're supposed to be. It's stomach and knots. And whatever your worst case scenario has been with a woman rejecting you, like we'll go all the way to there is the, the potential like, outlier. And I want you to just take a moment, just take that in, like, especially the first one. We'll talk about the woman reaction in a second, but that first one, just the stomach and knots feeling. You've sacrificed who you are to just not have that feeling a little bit longer. I want you to just take that in, because this was the first big wake up call for me. Again, me, I, I, I first noticed the issue with woman. It wasn't until later I realized it was in every area of my life. Woman was just kind of the most obvious because it was where I wanted it to be the least, you know, intrusive. Um, but when I thought about, like, I, especially I remember the first time I see a guy just being direct with his attraction towards a girl, something I'd never done in my entire life, except maybe in primary school. And I only did that once and learned a hard lesson sort of thing. But I remember seeing a guy doing it and just thinking like, the only reason I don't do that is because I feel a bit sick and my heart goes really fast. That, like when I write that down on paper, it's not like a hugely legitimate reason. It's not like I'm having limbs cut off or I'm being tortured by fire or I'm having family members slaughtered in front of me. It's, I just feel a bit sick. And what's really blows my mind is later on, I'm going to feel even worse than that for not doing it. And yet that feeling, I can't just like turn it up a couple of degrees on the volume knob to do what needs to be done. Cause I'm already feeling it anyway. I feel it just considering doing something. Like I feel my, my throat choke up just at the thought of having a confrontation. So it's not like I get to avoid this feeling. I'm already in it. Just, I'm, in simulation mode, I'm already feeling it. So to actually go through the confrontation would be to turn that from a six to an eight, maybe a 10, which is only going to be a bit worse. And yet rather than that, I'll, I'll walk backwards from a six, hoping that the feeling will go away. And yet later on at night, I'll have a nine and guilt for not doing it rather than just bumping that six up to an eight, having it done, and then getting to sleep peacefully. There's a kind of quantifiable logic error being made here. What are your yeah. thoughts on that? Well, I'd even add, let's call it like a nonstop low level four of just being lonely without having that. Right. The amazing That's thing about... Right. Yeah, the amazing thing about loneliness that I discovered is it's not other people making me feel that way. It's me letting myself down. Mm. The funny thing is I stopped feeling lonely long before I got a girlfriend. I stopped feeling lonely a few days after I first told a girl I was attracted to her and just went all in. Mm. That, that feeling just went away. I was like, that's what that feeling is. That feeling isn't nobody likes me. The feeling is I can't trust myself to try. Once I knew I could trust myself, I'm like, well, I've got the rest of my life to figure this out and I know I'm going to give it a crack. So odds are in my favor. You know, mm. I could technically go up to every girl on the planet. One of them's bound to say yes. And now that's a possibility. So the loneliness just disappeared. I, I see. Yes. I think I see. So like the loneliness is, like the frustrating with frustration with myself, seeing that these actions will never get someone 
to, you know, to get companionship. So it's not just that I don't have a companion in the moment. It's that I'm frustrated with myself and seeing that my actions will always lead to me being alone. And that's compounding it. Is that right? I believe it's even simpler than that. Frustration yeah. with yourself. Yeah. It's a splitting there. One entity being frustrated with another. The way I see it is that our minds, it's kind of like a committee, a group of people. Sometimes it's just two, the one doing and the one watching it being done. And other times there's other voices that pop in and out. But loneliness is when those things turn their back on each other, when they judge each other and criticize each other, when the you inside hates the you outside. The reason I know this basically to be a fact is because I've felt lonely in the presence of people who love me. And I've also felt an absence of loneliness while all by myself. So this isn't a proximity to people who like me thing or otherwise it wouldn't have those inconsistencies. If loneliness was about other people, then every time someone likes me, I'd never feel lonely. And every time I was alone, I'd feel lonely, but that's not the case at all. I can already guess for you, you've been in a situation surrounded by people that you consider friends and still felt lonely. And you'll notice that in those moments, the voice inside your head is critical, discouraging, um, contemptible, when the you inside doesn't like the other one. And closing that gap has nothing to do with other people. Mm-hmm. It comes from doing the things that you'll be proud of, where the one in you likes the one out of you and respects them and admires what he done. I like this idea of closing the gap. Well, I, not only do I mean this, it's important for you to hear the power in this. This doesn't require anything from other people. They barely need to exist for you to accomplish this. You're not lonely because you didn't, you know, because you don't have a girlfriend. You're lonely because you didn't go up to the last one and say hi. It doesn't mean because then she would have liked you. It's because then you would have liked you. When you walked away from her, it was really you walking away from you and what you wanted. And that's where the gap occurred. Because for you to like yourself, you have to pay that price. Stomach and knots. Somebody rejecting you. Somebody confronting you. Somebody at your work not liking what you did. Whatever. That's the price for you on the inside to go, well done. You did what you're supposed to. I like you now. I've had that feeling. Yep. What came to mind then? Like what, what's given you that feeling before? Oh, there's, there's been times where I, I did approach the woman lots of times actually. And even if she says no, at the end, I just feel this little bit of a buzz, you know, as I'm walking away, like, yes. (laughs) That's a feeling of being hugged by yourself, you know? getting a high five from yourself. Yeah. That's how powerful you are. You can create that feeling pretty much any time of the day. You just have to know what the thing you need to do is. Well, you know, one of the things I don't like about the the modern self-help movement is this kind of vague bullshit about self-acceptance, but you just got to love yourself. This idea you can somehow just look in the mirror and go, yeah, I like you now. I say, no, 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 you got to earn it. (laughs) You don't just get given respect. You earn respect. Your inner self has this list. I call them values. Other people call them maybe principles or code of honor, whatever you want to call it, that you have to live by and then you love yourself. It's not about achievements or outcomes. Nothing external to you has to be different. Everybody can reject you. You might not make the money, whatever, that's fine. As long as you lived by the principle, you know, the unconditional love thing comes after the conditions are met, you know, 
it comes once you know like he'll try his best to do that then i'll let him off for the little failures that's really interesting because i've had a lot of people say talk about this it seems like a recent thing like love yourself love yourself and i've like i never really knew what they were talking about and it just never really gelled with me like how does this work but yeah it didn't make any sense to me really Well, one way to look at it is, is it's, you look at reasons why you might not love someone else. You know, that's how I figured out what my values are. You know, if someone lies to me and deceives me, I don't like them anymore. So honesty must be one of my values. When someone complains about the things that they could change, you know, they bitch and they moan about something that's in their power, it annoys me. So responsibility is one of my values. And what I realize is every time I don't like myself, it's because I've done one of those things. I've lied, I've deceived, I've stepped back from what I'm responsible for, of being a coward. All these things that I, I don't like in other people, they're just like a mirror, like, oh, that's what I need to do to like myself. And I realized that all those things that I needed to do were things that were emotionally difficult to do sickening sometimes mm. you know for me like embarrassment that for me it feels like hot acid going through my like whole torso i call it the acid flush you know it, it's really nauseating and just like i heat up immediately and become super sensitive it's a high price to pay but on the other side of that is that yes i did it but I'd always step back from that feeling. There's so many times where I need to step forward in that feeling. Confrontation, you know, that hot, like panicky, adrenaline pumping, knee shaking, like, holy shit, I might get punched in the face or something. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, you know, every time I step back from that, I'd just be like vibrating the rest of the day, just loathing myself, but kind of helpless. Like, I can't think of anything else I could have done not realizing that actually stepping into the confrontation was an option. I just would have lost. That's all. But that would have been fine. Losing's not a problem. It's stepping back. That's a problem. Mm. When you talk about woman and dating and, and even your career, I think I get a sense of one of the common dilemmas for a nice guy, which is your brain demands results before reward it says like you have to do well with women you have to have a successful career and whatever that means to you these very quantifiable often quite materialistic standards um and that can be a dilemma for valued living because you're like well what's the point of being courageous if it won't work and that little, you know, that little conversation we talk to ourselves before we decide not to go and talk to the girl we like. It's a little thing, well, she's probably got a boyfriend. So even if you were brave, she's just going to say no. Like, why not just go get like a nice comforting chocolate bar instead and everybody wins. It's kind of thing. You know, it uses like the it has to work thing as a criteria for doing it. Does that resonate with you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really interesting, actually. Just thinking I'm putting all my emphasis on wanting external rewards. So like had a career that made much higher than average salary, like all my financial needs were met. Um, and, but inside was dying essentially. Mm. <laughs> Be too dramatic, but it, it's, it, I mean, whatever I felt allows me to say that I felt like I was dying inside, you know? Um, and then same thing with the women, uh, approaching the women, putting too much emphasis and hope on an external result, which is them saying yes or whatever versus thinking about the internal benefit I would gain by even just being able to walk away with that 
feeling of yes i did it you know even if they say no i'm st i still walk away smiling usually because i'm just glad i i did it for a change you know so actually i don't know that could be huge just let go of the i guess quest for money career-wise i mean you still have to have it but do you know what i mean not overly emphasizing it but thinking more about the internal rewards of doing something I'm drawn to do. And that, that would even cover approaching a girl, like she's attractive and I'm drawn to her, to go talk to her. Sometimes my, my brain just goes crazy and looks ahead to the future and it's drawn to this kind of potential future I can see in her because of her qualities. You know, I, like with that girl I liked, I could see us um spending time together and like doing things that i'm interested in because she looked she seemed like she was interested in him and she seemed like she had a great character and that we'd have just you know a great existence together um yeah so yeah so looking more to the internal than the, the external i think would be a great uh, shift in my focus. One way to look at it is it's not really black and white as much as it is a hierarchy. And at the moment, integrity is way down the bottom of that pyramid. And at the top is probably emotional comfort in the moment, emotional comfort, even though that's actually being sacrificed. Um, followed by say approval from others or wealth or whatever. And that's kind of the priority system. What I'm suggesting is the cure to nice guy syndrome is simply that integrity is put at the top. It doesn't mean you're not allowed the other stuff. It means the other stuff is not allowed at the cost of integrity. So you're allowed to form a relationship with a woman, but not if it means you have to be dishonest. Not if it means that, you know, she encourages cowardice or whatever it is that you don't value. I'm partly biased by my own values as I give these examples, but I'm also throwing out there ones that I'm hearing from you. For example, if you, if you hate yourself for backing away from the scary thing, well, that's cowardice. So if you hate cowardice, you probably value courage. Um, and if not speaking your mind to someone bothers you, then honesty is probably something you value or perhaps assertiveness or whatever. So plus I've found that nice guys who suffer from nice guy syndrome, it's typically the same values that they're sacrificing that they wish they had. And then once they live by them, they're like, fuck yeah. And they feel that power. Like finally I'm in control of this body. Like I can do what I want. Finally. Um, but the, what I'm, what I'm suggesting to you just as a concept that you'll have to flesh out in more detail is what it will look like if that, that integrity thing, which is you living by that GPS in your head, trying to get on the path. What if it went to the top where money had to wait behind it? Money is allowed to come in as long as none of those principles are compromised and relationships and love and sex that's allowed in too but nothing's allowed to be compromised for those things they they're like icing on the cake the cake has to be there first you know rather than like if i can get away with being honest then i'll do it or you know if it's not scary then i'll do it you know actually going no, no knots in the stomach people reacting badly fine i'll pay that price to put that thing at the top of the pyramid as often as I possibly can. Yeah, <clears throat> it feels good and it feels scary, right? <laughs> like, um, especially with the work thing, um, I know that I can do a particular job and make more money than I need to survive, which is a good thing. Um, but it's not at all aligned with my values. Um, 
it's not like it's amoral. It's just it has nothing to do with what I would ultimately want to be doing with my time on earth and my drive to, you know, be of service is in a much different area. And so, uh, so it feels good to walk more in alignment with like who I feel I am inside, but it's also scary because I can't see how that will be, you know, let's say financially viable. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I can, I can carry on walking kind of contrary to my values professionally and not have to worry about money, but actually be really kind of like, you know, dying inside, so to speak. Um, or I, it feels good to think about living within my values professionally, but I, I just have no idea, you know, how that would be sustainable. But it yeah. feels exciting to think about that. And I'm, yeah. There's a couple of things to point out. First of all, is your fear is already trying to knock this back off track. And it'll do it by saying, how's that supposed to make money? Or how's that supposed to make a girl like you or whatever? And it's not really asking those questions. It's throwing them at you like punches. First thing to keep in mind is you already know how to do the, the money thing. So if this integrity trip turns out to be not worth it, you can just go back to the other one. Just, just go back to the old way. If that's the least miserable of the two, you can do it. Mm-hmm. And if being open and honest with women is more painful in the long run than being lonely. You just go back to being lonely. You can do that. You're never obliged to go a step further than you want to. But the key way to frame this is you're at zero. If you've been a nice guy your whole life, what we're talking about is a completely new way of living of which you have zero expertise, maybe some glimpses and some, tastes and some highlights in your life where you kind of peered through the curtain you know those moments where you walked away going fuck yeah you're like oh, yeah, i can see sort of what it's like what you're supposed to do i've had come like a highlights reel but you haven't actually kind of bathed in it immersed yourself and it been like that like 90 percent of the time for a sustainable period and seeing what that does because it's not all highlights reels you know there is, you have to face all those emotions that you duck out of. You have to stay in confusion and not knowing what you're doing until it ends, not just bail on it because it's not going for too long. For example, you know, talking specific to us, when I first started my coaching business, it was three years, I think, until I was like, I finally really got the hang of this. That's a long time to be confused. That doesn't mean I was just totally like, Ooh, lost the whole time. But I mean, like eight out of 10 things I tried didn't work. I don't know why they didn't work and so on. That's valued life where like things are hard and you're not just cruising. You have to pick away at everything and and you just constantly, it's like learning to drive from scratch. You know, everything's a mystery at the beginning. And that's what it was like for me. It was the same, like I had to start from zero with women. I had to get to this point. I'm like, you know what? The way I am with them, I obviously just don't know anything about them. I'm just going to call that out and not pretend I've been, you know, hoarding these little nuts of knowledge over time. I actually, I don't know shit. I'm at zero. And maybe everyone who gives me advice and shit doesn't know anything either. So maybe I'm just going to have to start this thing all on my own. Like it's a new planet that no one's been to before. And that was actually a really helpful approach for me with women as I just, I'm like, okay, I'm going to start by making friends with them. Are they actually the alien species that I make them out to be? Or, you know, are they more human than I give them credit for? And of course, you know, five years of that led to the realization where I just see them as people, which completely transformed my dating life. Suddenly I'm not anxious for their approval anymore. And I don't see them as like the, the key holders, you know, is holding on to them, my happiness anymore. They're just people walking around. And once I saw them as that, you know, forming relationships with them became effortless. 
mm. because it is actually effortless. It's I was the one making it hard, so on. So right. you're at this position where you're standing at this marker called zero with a list of bullet points from your life of glimpses you've had as to where this might be going and really nothing more. Something that you're probably going to throw away later because it wasn't really accurate. Or you've got this other path that you've been before. You know how it goes. You know how to do it. You know what it feels like to do it. It sucks, and that's the reason you've been considering this new one. But if you ever want to go back there, you've, you've already mapped this one out. You can go back anytime you want. The only thing you need to know is what is the next thing you're going to do. Hmm. It's actually one of the key elements to breaking this pathway down into a manageable thing rather than this big overwhelming, threatening unknown is what would a little bit more integrity than usual look like, say, tomorrow? What's the answer to that question? Um, the only example I can think of at the moment is like my current work is just giving me a lot of anxiety. Um, and it's a bit drastic, but like almost to just like, like just tell them, say, look, I'm feeling really anxious about this role and I'm not sure it's a good fit. So you don't even need to quit. You could just say, I'm feeling anxious about the role. Can we talk about it? And you're already taking a step down that path now. And that's it. You can take that one step and go, oh no, fuck this. I don't want to do it anymore. And that's fine. Or you take the one step and after you've taken it, go, well, what would the next one be? But you don't have to answer that question until the first one's been done. Mm. And you basically just kind of create the path as you go. Maybe it means I should do this next and then this. You'll never have to take a risk bigger than what you want to. But you'll always have to take risks. Yeah. Because that's the key difference. The self-sacrificing is a risk-free approach. Mm. You know, the other people always win, so there's no, there's no danger in that path. No danger from others. But of course, we always have to pay somewhere, and you've been paying internally for those risk-free strategies. So now we're going to switch that around. You're going to do what's right for you internally, but it's going to create external risks. At least you'll think it will. You know, reality might show you something different as time plays out. But your mind will definitely go, this is 100% risky. I, I know it, even when it's wrong. And I think what we'll do is we'll just let you process that. No obligation. No pressure. Just understand like there is another way. It's just an unknown way. And you know, the, your flashlight only goes a little distance in the future. You have to actually walk to see more of it, which means you have to do these uncomfortable things and like earn your way down the path. To even if to, even just to figure out that it's a dead end, if that's the case, I tell you from experience and working with so many guys like us that it's not a dead end. It's fucking path to freedom. Um, but it's not everyone can pay the price. You know, I've, I've had coaching clients that I've you know, told that we can't work together at this time and so on like that because they just weren't prepared to pay and I can't, there's no other way around. There's, there's no free way to get down this path. You don't get to be courageous without being afraid. You don't get to be responsible without being stressed and angry. You don't get to be honest without getting rejected. Like you just, you have to pay. That's it. What's great is once you kind of break through and you've set up a life that's now based on those values, 
you don't have to pay much. Like the rent's really low. So like I don't have to confront people very often these days because I've gotten rid of anybody I'd need to confront a long time ago and I don't let them in anymore. My confrontations are these small little like deal breakers. So if I meet a guy who's a dick, I make sure he knows straight away and then I never have to see him again. And I don't have like an endless series of hassles with that guy kind of thing, but I had to earn my way there. You know? Oh my gosh. So like, sounds like what, what you're saying is like when you first approach the girl, like you have this, in this case, you have like this pain at the beginning and then you approach it and then either she says yes or no, but you're happy that you've done it at least. So the pain goes away. So it's that momentary blip. But you're saying even on a larger scale, like making a shift your whole life in this direction, there'll be a, a large momentary blip, but then over time that will dissipate as well. So you're like kind of into the clear on a larger scale as well. Is that right? Well, it's, it's more like understanding that most of the size of that blip is what we add to reality. The, the blip itself is very small. So like the pain of confronting someone is actually almost zero. It's everything we do in our mind that hurts. Mm. So you do a thousand confrontations and you stop doing the extra shit in your mind. Uh, yeah. You know, so I think of like uh, there's confrontation that pops into my head from a little while ago where I made somebody cry and the old nice guy, me, that would have been weeks of hell. To make someone cry, the guilt would have eaten me alive. The effort to make them like me again and so on afterwards would have been, you know, Everest level. Um, this time I was just kind of a bit like, oh, that sucks. Oh, well, that was the size of the blip. And I'm like, oh, I prefer it if she didn't cry and you know, I feel some pity for her sort of thing, but it had to be said. So here we are. Nice. You know, um, so the blips are still there and that's a key thing. I still pay rent. I'm not in some problem free place and I never will be. I still have the full range of emotions every week, including the ones like confusion, even depression and anxiety. But now I'm choosing when to have them because I'm choosing the events. I'm not like being beset with them as in a kind of a retroactive way. So I'm not like, oh, I fucked up last week and now I feel bad about it. It's like, no, I've got to go do that thing and it's going to feel bad to do. So let's go do it. I choose my blips. You know, it's very, you know, life will still be upsetting to me sometimes, but most of the time I'm choosing the upset, exactly how much of it I'm going to take and so on. Whereas before it was, I ran away from all those and then they chased me. You know, mm. That's what it felt like anyway. I was constantly running away from my, regrets um the main thing i want to emphasize is the moves will not feel good to do your brain will tell you not to your dial will go from a six to an eight maybe even a ten sometimes your brain will be going i can't believe you're doing this stop it it's fucking uncomfortable it'd be so much easier to do a b and c and you just still do it anyway and then afterwards you like go oh it's done and that's when the reward comes, not before, but after. The relief and the pride come after you've earned it. Respect. And you just try and stack those up, basically. Nice. The great thing is you don't have to stop being nice. You just, if you're going to be nice now, it's going to be done for the right reasons. It's going to be done without needing appreciation. It'll be done even if nobody notices you do it. You were doing it because it's the right thing to do rather than to get something. You know, you don't have to stop. You don't have to stop being an asshole. It'd just be a different form of insecure. But uh, I think the big one that hit home for me was realizing I'd never really been that nice because it always came at a price. Nice with a price isn't nice. That's just. It's like a service-based business. I'm selling nice, except you don't know I'm selling. You just end up in debt. So it's been amazing for me now. I'm so much more assertive and confrontational than I ever was, but I'm genuinely much nicer now than I ever was. When I do a good deed for someone, I can change their life, and they might not even know I did it now. 
rather than the petty little things I used to do to try and make people laugh or like me. That wasn't really niceness at all. So let's kind of sum this up. You know, we talk about a lot, 90% of it will fall out of your head. It's partly why we record, and that's fine, it's normal. But what's the key insights coming through for you and, and the actions that it might prompt you to take? I feel like I've got to do this. Yeah, I feel like I'm at a turning point. Um, the biggest, one of the biggest ones is this idea of keeping in mind the internal reward and basically forget about the external reward. It's the big one. If you can pay that price, you can do this. Hmm. And you gotta understand the internal reward's not a high. It's not like the external reward of some pretty girl agreeing to have sex with you and that big dopamine rush. It's not like that. You're going to go from drug taking those highs to a much deeper, mellow, satisfying feeling of like I'm being who I should be. It's not a spike on the high graph, but it's more like a steady increase of confidence. You know? It's like uh, getting fit and healthy the proper way rather than just taking dietary pills and dropping like 10 gauges in a week. You know, it's about slowly building up strength and power and fitness and just kind of gradually feeling that power increase. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, to me, it sounds like the, the benefits, you know, far outweigh the, the pain of getting there. Well, next comes the test. <laughs> There's no one who can make you do it, man. You will just have to choose a moment and break the rules that you usually follow and feel what you usually avoid feeling. And, and you don't have to do it for long. You can bail on it as soon as it started if you want to, because anything's more than what you used to do. Everything's progress. You don't have to stay in there as the girl yells at you to go away. You can just go, okay, sorry, walk off. Because going up to her was huge, you know. You tell your boss, oh, I'm a bit anxious about my job. He's like, what, what the fuck? And he has a big reaction you didn't expect. You go, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it later. It's fine. You can back down, you know, if you hit your limit, as long as you realize you actually tried to hit your limit. You know, you actually tried to find the edge rather than staying way close to the safe center, you know? Yeah. There's no pressure to climb Mount Everest on your first trip, you know? You just, some steps, any, and you build them up and it's a cumulative process. You know, I didn't go from nice guy to something else overnight. It was more like collecting drops in a bucket until the bucket was full, you know? A lot of pain, but definitely do it again. In fact, I still pay with pain these days, you know, to maintain myself. All right, shall we wrap it up there for today? Yeah, that's really good, Dan. Thank you for that. Well, I appreciate you being honest with me, man. That's one of the key things to recovery is you have to be at least honest with yourself. That's where it has to start. You have to be honest with what you're doing and why you're doing it and who you really are. And then when you're working with someone who's supporting you through this to be as honest as you can with them. And then the honesty with other people who are more unsafe, that, yeah, that can be built up. But you've got to start with a foundation. So I appreciate you opening up to me. I know how hard that is because I've had to go through that myself. Um, but you know enough now, if you can take the actions, you've got the whole recipe. Yeah. If you can endure those actions for the time, however long it takes to endure them until you kind of get on track and stay on track. And then it's just a matter of just staying on, which is so much easier than getting on. You know, once you get on, which is like I call the transition, the maintenance is just required to stay within the edges. But finding that track again is really hard. So I definitely respect you for looking into it. And I'll admire you when you take your actions. I know what you have to pay and how much it sucks, but the power's in your hands now. 
Awesome. Thank you.